Hi, I'm Lisa Pomeroy, a member of the medical education team at Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory. I'd like to welcome you to this short training video on beta-glucuronidase. Today we'll be discussing how to interpret beta-glucuronidase on the GI MAP test and strategies to decrease it when it's elevated. So first of all, what is beta-glucuronidase? Well, beta-glucuronidase is an enzyme that can be produced by certain species of intestinal bacteria and cells in the liver, kidneys, intestinal epithelium, endocrine organs, and reproductive organs. Now, the marker beta-glucuronidase on the GI MAP test represents beta-glucuronidase activity. So it's measuring the activity of the enzyme and not the quantitative amount of the enzyme. A level, level greater than 2,486 is considered high by the lab and is undesirable. Now, in order to understand beta-glucuronidase, we need to understand glucuronidation. So the problem with beta-glucuronidase is it essentially undoes what the liver accomplished during phase two detoxification through glucuronidation. With glucuronidation, glucuronic acid is bound to toxins to limit their absorption and enterohepatic resorption. So beta-glucuronidase enzymes break that bond, thereby freeing those toxins and allowing them to go back in circulation. Here's an analogy for this. Picture glucuronidation as a box. So the liver is getting things all packaged up, and so it puts toxins it wants to get rid of inside of a box, puts the lid on the box, and ties a nice little bow around the box with a ribbon. Well, along comes beta-glucuronidase, like a pair of scissors. It snips the ribbon, unties the bow, opens the lid, and lets all the toxins out of the box so they can wreak havoc. Now, glucuronidation is used by the body to eliminate numerous substances. This includes hormones such as estrogen, testosterone, and steroid hormones, xenobiotics, which would include pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, and industrial pollutants, mold mycotoxins, and many pharmaceutical medications. So all of these can be reabsorbed when beta-glucuronidase is high. There are a number of possible reasons for high beta-glucuronidase. Here are some of the top reasons. First, bacterial overgrowth. There can also be a lack of beneficial flora. Antibiotic use, liver stress, dietary factors, and lifestyle factors. Let's go over these one by one. First, we have bacterial overgrowth or dysbiosis. This is often the top reason behind high beta-glucuronidase activity. Beta-glucuronidase is produced by a subset of bacteria in the microbiome. So if these species are overgrowing in the intestinal tract, there may be high beta-glucuronidase. Major bacterial producers of fecal beta-glucuronidase include Escherichia coli, otherwise known as E. coli, Clostridium species, Bacteroides fragilis, and other Bacteroides species, Staphylococcus species, Ruminococcus species, Eubacterium species, and Peptostreptococcus species. So when you see elevated beta-glucuronidase activity on the GI MAP test, examine the report to see if any of the following bacterial markers are also high. There's Bacteroides fragilis, Escherichia species, Clostridia class, Bacteroides phylum, Firmicutes phylum, Staphylococcus species, and Staphylococcus aureus. 
Now, the GI map doesn't individually test ruminococcus species, eubacterium species, or peptostreptococcus species. However, those genera are included within the Clostridia class and Formicides phylum. So if you see Clostridia class and or Formicides phylum elevated, it's possible that these genera could be contributing to that. The second reason that can contribute to high beta-glucuronidase activity is a lack of beneficial flora. Having low levels of certain bacteria can affect beta-glucuronidase activity. That's because normal bacterial flora consume fiber and produce short-chain fatty acids. And short-chain fatty acids help acidify the colon. We know from the research that having a lower colonic pH is associated with decreased beta-glucuronidase activity, and having a higher colonic pH is associated with increased beta-glucuronidase activity. Therefore, if there's a lack of these short-chain fatty acid producers, there could be a higher colonic pH and increased beta-glucuronidase activity. Another possible reason for elevated levels of beta-glucuronidase is antibiotic use. Antibiotic treatments can lead to increased levels of beta-glucuronidase in the colon. The reason for this is certain antibiotics may select for bacteria expressing beta-glucuronidase enzyme. Antibiotics may kill certain species of bacteria while sparing others, which can allow those that do survive, such as E. coli, to overgrow due to lack of competition. Antibiotics do seem to preferentially kill short-chain fatty acid-producing bacteria, especially the butyrate-producing species that help acidify the gut and decrease beta-glucuronidase activity. Another reason is liver stress. Remember, bacteria aren't the only things that can produce beta-glucuronidase. The body can too. And the liver is one of the organs that's able to produce beta-glucuronidase enzymes. So liver cells can make the beta-glucuronidase enzyme itself. Now the liver is always making some beta-glucuronidase because we're always detoxifying. But when there is increased liver detoxification, the liver may produce quite a bit of beta-glucuronidase. Remember all the things that go through glucuronidation. Medications and toxins are detoxified through glucuronidation. Actually, 40 to 70% of medications are processed through the glucuronidation pathway. So ask, is the patient taking any medications, prescription or over-the-counter? And this could be Tylenol, aspirin, Aleve, oral contraceptives, bio bioidentical estrogen or testosterone, or benzodiazepines. Those are all subject to, beta to glucuronidation. And many mold mycotoxins are produced through glucuronidation. So does a patient live or work in a water damaged building? Has there been exposure to mold? and many environmental pollutants are processed through glucuronidation. So is the patient being exposed to xenobiotics, pesticides in their food, chemicals in their water, they're drinking out of plastic water bottles and so forth. So all of these are going to put a stress on the liver. Now, if the liver itself is inflamed or damaged, there can be high beta-glucuronidase activity too. So they've noted this in situations like cirrhosis. And if glucuronidation is impaired due to genetic SNPs, specifically SNPs in the UGT enzymes, there can be high beta-glucuronidase activity. Then we have dietary factors. Diet significantly influences beta-glucuronidase activity. High protein, High meat, high fat, and low fiber diets have all been associated with higher beta-glucuronidase activity. Also, chemicals used on food can increase beta-glucuronidase activity, like herbicides, pesticides, insecticides, and so forth. 
and alcohol consumption can impact beta-glucuronidase activity as well, since it is subject to glucuronidation. Lifestyle factors may increase beta-glucuronidase activity too. For example, substances found in tobacco smoke are processed through glucuronidation. So is your patient a smoker or exposed to secondhand smoke? Drinking or eating out of cans or bottles lined with BPA or BPS can increase beta-glucuronidase activity since these chemicals are cleared through glucuronidation. So does your patient drink out of plastic water bottles or eat a lot of canned food where they would be exposed to these chemicals? Also, eating high temperature cooked meat can increase beta-glucuronidase activity due to carcinogenic compounds formed such as HCAs and PAHs. So does the patient frequently grill or char their meat? So those are some of the top reasons that I'm looking for when I see an elevated beta-glucuronidase. Now, what are some of the consequences of having high beta-glucuronidase? Well, high beta-glucuronidase may increase cancer risk. And that's because hormones and toxins re-enter the bloodstream instead of being eliminated from the body. So the longer these substances are in the body, the greater the chance they have of causing harm. Now, beta-glucuronidase elevations have been associated with breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colon cancer. Another potential consequence of high beta-glucuronidase is it may lead to high estrogen. And that's because beta-glucuronidase breaks the bond between estrogen and glucuronic acid. So the estrogen is released back into circulation instead of being eliminated in the stool. Therefore, too much beta-glucuronidase causes an excess of circulating estrogen. This can lead to estrogen dominant symptoms such as PMS, menstrual cramps, and breast tenderness. These are some of the top symptoms I look for when I see a high beta-glucuronidase, especially in a, if it's in a premenopausal cycling woman. Now, long-term excess estrogen could also lead to endometriosis or breast cancer. Okay, so what do we do about it? We see high beta-glucuronidase. We want to try to decrease that. What are our strategies that we can take in order to lower that activity? Well, first, address any bacterial overgrowth that was identified on the report. You may use antimicrobial herbs or probiotics, for example, to do this. Then support the growth of short-chain fatty acid-producing bacteria bacteria if they are low. Now you may do some dietary changes and maybe bring in some supplemental prebiotics to accomplish this. Improve the diet. So decrease protein or meat consumption if they're excessive and increase fiber consumption. Now the patient could also consume foods that provide glucaric acid. This would be foods like citrus, apples, and cruciferous vegetables. The reason these may be helpful is glucaric acid in foods is transformed in the stomach into a metabolite that inhibits beta-glucuronidase activity. Also, be sure to reduce exposure to environmental toxins that are cleared through glucuronidation. So make sure the patient is buying organic food and drinking purified water, using non-toxic products in their home and et cetera. Then supplemental wise, you could consider probiotics. That's because some lactobacillus species and bifidobacterium species can decrease beta-glucuronidase activity. Also consider supplements that directly inhibit beta-glucuronidase activity. The top supplement for this purpose is calcium deglucurate. Now, calcium deglucurate may not be the best choice if the patient has low estrogen levels 
or is taking a lot of medications. And that's because calcium deglucarate does help the body clear estrogen. So if the patient is, say, a postmenopausal woman who's already struggling with having lower estrogen levels, if you give calcium deglucarate, especially at higher doses, you could drop her estrogen and cause more issues. So if that's the case, you can do everything else on here on this page. You just would skip the calcium deglucarate but other things, the dietary support, balancing out the microbiome, and general liver support supplements could be used instead. And then if the patient is taking a lot of medications, this could be problematic, not because there's a direct interaction, but because, again, a lot of medications are cleared through glucuronidation. So it could speed up the clearance of these medications from the body, which could mean that they're not as effective because they're not staying around in the body as long as they should be to have that therapeutic effect. Now, other supplements to consider would be supplements that support liver function and or glucuronidation. The top supplements for this would be milk thistle, dandelion root, astaxanthin, rosemary, and resveratrol. So if you see elevated beta-glucuronidase on the GI map report, these are some of the top considerations of things that you can do, some actionable steps to help your patient lower their beta-glucuronidase activity. I've included a couple reference slides here at the end in case you want to pause and read further about beta-glucuronidase. Again, thanks for listening to this short presentation on beta-glucuronidase. I hope you found it insightful and that you'll know better how to help your patients when you see this comeback elevated on the GI map report. For further information about the GI map, you can contact us at www.diagnosticsolutionslab.com. Thanks.